this is Duke University. The 1960s represented a tumultuous period politically and nowhere more so than American college campuses where black student activists pushed back against the status quo. And historian Martha Biondi argues in her new book, Black Revolution on Campus, that their activism radically transformed not only the experiences of black students on American campuses, but American education, higher education in general. Today we're joined by Northwestern historian Martha Biondi to talk about her new book, The Black Revolution on Campus. My name is Mark Anthony Neal, and this is Left to Black. Yeah. Eric, you're a real IG Eric. for this one. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal, and we're joined this afternoon via Skype by historian and professor Martha Biondi who is the author of the new book, The Black Revolution on Campus at the University of California Press. She is an associate professor of African American Studies and History at Northwestern University, and she's also the author of the award-winning To Stand and Fight, The Struggle for Civil Rights in Post-War New York City. How are you doing today, Martha? I'm doing great, Mark. How are you? Uh, your book, of course, is very timely. There's so many universities and colleges, you know, going back two years previously and going three years forward, that are gonna be marking this kind of moment of integration um, at their colleges and universities. Uh, 50 years here at Duke, for instance, where at the beginning stage of a 50 year anniversary of the presence of, of black students on campus, at least a large presence of black students. Can you talk a little bit about how you got interested in this particular um, aspect of the story of the black, re re of the black uh, liberation struggle? Well, um, as you pointed out, um, my first book was on the civil rights movement in the 1940s and 50s in New York City. And one of the main leaders in that movement, a trade unionist named Ewart Guinier, went on to mm -hmm. become the first chair of Afro-American Studies at Harvard. So he was a pivotal figure um, in that study, and I was always very aware of him being on the vanguard or front lines of where the movement was going. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to follow, just to keep following his life. And initially I was going to do um, a case study of Harvard and Howard. And then I decided to broaden it into a national story and a national study, in part because um, you know, as a, as a teacher of the civil rights movement, I was very aware that many documentaries, many textbooks portray the end of the movement, the decline of the movement as happening in 1968 with the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. That's often portrayed as this end mark, this unraveling, there's urban insurrection and a kind of general disarray. Um, and the kind of rise of black power is typically defined in a very negative way if it's included at all in a lot of these standard accounts. And so, what I discovered in this is I began to do this research that actually, instead of being a decline, 1968 was a period of acceleration, expansion, and growth. And in fact, the movement grew enormously across the country at colleges and universities. I mean, one of the numbers that, that it seemed a lot. I mean, one of the statistics that shocked me when I when I read the book is the idea is that a, a more than a 50 percent growth of of African American students, black students, at uh, in colleges and universities from 1970 to 1974. I mean, just on that kind of level, you're wondering how institutions had the capacity to withstand, you know, what was clearly a kind of fundamental shift in the demographics of their campuses, right? And, and, and a, a generation of students that also bring in with them certain kinds of expectations and demands about how a university should respond to their needs. I mean, one of the most compelling arguments that you make in the book, and you can elaborate on, is this idea that you know as we're thinking about the shutting down of the black power and civil rights movements in fact black student activists on these campuses radically transform Amer american universities and colleges right they really change the business of the university because of their presence oh yeah and we take so much of that for granted now i mean the legacy uh is really substantial i mean these students accomplished a great deal um and you're right, there was a huge growth in black collegiate enrollments in the early 1970s. And it's a, that's a direct, you know, that's a direct result of this activism. Um, these students, um, in many ways, were redefining the process of integration that had been developing in the early 1960s, in which 
very small numbers of African Americans had been admitted entry into predominantly white universities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They felt that this was token integration. They felt that they were treated as culturally deprived, that they were expected to sort of leave their culture at home and assimilate into this like overwhelming sea of whiteness where they encountered a predominantly Eurocentric curriculum. And they really, you know, they really mobilized and organized to, to really to confront that, to challenge their professors, to challenge administrators, and to change that in many ways, to change who was the professoriate, who were the students in the classroom, what would the curriculum be. I mean, they posed all of these major questions about yeah. what constitutes knowledge, who produces knowledge, uh, who gets access to elite universities. Uh, this generation put all those questions on the table and they really they tr and you're right they transformed American higher education in numerous ways you're watching left to black I'm your host Mark Anthony there we're joined this afternoon by historian Martha Biondi who is a professor of African American studies and history at Northwestern University the author of the new book the black revolution on campus at the University of California press when folks kind of remember this history of black student activism in the 1960s San Francisco State um, and the activities there come up over and over again, right? And in fact, it may be the most romanticized moment uh, of this particular history. But your book really takes us to these other narratives. And, and, and again, one of the more surprising narratives is the level of activity that's taking place at historically black colleges and universities, right? Which we traditionally think about as being socially conservative. Um, we think about them as being away from the fray, if you will, but what you show in the book is that there was an intense amount of uh, organizing and struggling that took place at HBCUs that in some ways was the driving force for student activism during the era. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, but before I get to the story of HBCUs, I want to say something about San Francisco State because mm -hmm. you began with that. Mm -hmm. and. It's interesting you use the word romanticized. Maybe that, that romanticized image of that struggle um, results from the fact that it was really an apocal battle. It was a five-month strike at a predominantly yeah. white campus in which black studies was the number one demand. Yeah. Like that in itself is really striking. And, they, and as in other universities, the students achieved a lot. In fact, they achieved the first and only College of Ethnic Studies in the nation. They didn't only win a Department of African American Studies, they won a College of Ethnic yeah. Studies. Yeah. Um, they wanted to call it uh, the College of Third World Studies. They didn't win on that name, but they won the creation of a college that would include Latino studies and Asian American studies. Um, so that was very significant. It wasn't a romantic struggle in the sense that the cops busted a lot of heads. I mean, yeah. these students yeah. really, suffered um, in many ways um, for being, um, you know, and they were very militant and they, they adopted some very confrontational tactics. So they made certain choices. Um, but Ronald Reagan was governor and he wanted to respond with a hard line. And he and the mayor of San Francisco um, deployed hundreds of, of, of members of the tactical squad, the, the infamous San Francisco police force, and they virtually occupied that campus for months. Hundreds of students were arrested. Uh, several did serious time. Uh, one student was deported to the Caribbean. So these students, like you see with students, with the young people in SNCC and the Southern Civil Rights Movement, who took a lot of risks and made a lot of sacrifices, uh, personal sacrifices for the sake of widening opportunity for a broader group of African Americans and a broader group of people of color, that's absolutely true for that cohort at San Francisco State. Mm -hmm. You know, a remarkable uh, uh, group of students um, in, uh, in the Bay Area, which itself was really a, a movement center uh, by the late 1960s. And now I can shift to your question about the school <laughs> of um, um, Yes, it's interesting. They have this reputation as being kind of more quiescent, politically quiescent and conservative. Mm -hmm. Stokely Carmichael would certainly not agree with that characterization and wouldn't like to hear that. You know, as we know, uh, Howard was an incubator of student mm -hmm. activism across the 1960s, and many mm -hmm. Howard students dropped out of college, right, to go south and to join the Southern Civil Rights Movement. HBCU, uh, you know, students at historically black colleges at Tougaloo, at Morehouse, um, played vital roles in the Southern Civil Rights Movement. Uh, what you see in the late 1960s is a shift. The students decide to look closer to home, um, and they waged struggles um, at many colleges and universities across the South. It's interesting. This was a period in which students were really rethinking and revising this whole process of integration. And I had already mentioned what that looked like on white campuses. 
for students at black colleges, especially public black colleges, they feared the loss of these institutions. They worried that maybe integration would mean, right, that these institutions would be sacrificed into the larger, you know, the, the white public colleges and that they would lose some sense of, of, of autonomy or control over these institutions, even though they were underfunded, even though they didn't have the same degree of resources and funding that the public white colleges had. So they, they really wanted to preserve these schools, and that became the new, you know, one of the goals of the student struggle of the late 1960s was the preservation of historically black colleges, the strengthening of them, and the redefining of their purpose toward uh, black community empowerment and serving black communities and making themselves uh, 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 the source of a new leadership class for black America. So there was a kind of, uh, you know, an effort to preserve these institutions, to strengthen these institutions, and to redefine them, and to make them uh, sources of, of, of black consciousness and black power. They called it the black university. The quest was to <laughs> shift Negro colleges to black universities. What was the response of some of these institutions? I, I know that, in, particularly in Howard, you know, there was a takeover, and you know they're they're rounding up black trustees, locking them in buildings, and and still you know this is a moment where there are many African Americans still really invested in the sheen of black respectability. Um, you mentioned a, a New York Amsterdam news reporter who was very critical in the early stages of of, of some of the protests uh, that they weren't really embodying the way that Negroes were supposed to embody themselves, college-educated Negroes. Um, how did some of these institutions navigate this pressure that was coming from students? Well, it's a good question, and it's complicated, because um, especially if you look at the difference between private <coughs> and then the public schools, the mm -hmm. public colleges faced a lot more political pressure from the state, from right. the white political leaders of the state, at any inkling of student protest that political class wanted to, typically wanted to call in the police and sometimes call in the National Guard. Right. And that Orangeburg, in, in cases, right. Orangeburg and uh, Jackson State and places like that, yeah. Was very, very tragic. Um, and it led even to the shoot, shooting deaths oh. of, of many students at North Carolina A&T, at Jackson State, as you mentioned, and then at Southern University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana in 1972. Uh, so that was one way campus leaders responded was, was you know, student protesters at, at, at HBCUs face much more lethal police invasion yeah. that, than, than students. Even though I mentioned this police occupation of San Francisco State, it was even worse at historically black colleges. Uh -huh. um, but what you would see happen is that oftentimes the black administrator, the black president, would try and shield the students from that and That's would argue against the yeah. police. If it was a public school, they were often overruled again by the white political leadership that was hungry for police action um, um, but but at, at you know at private schools as well the students suffered many disciplinary uh, 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 penalties for their you know taking over a building or conducting a sit-in um, there was a, there was um, uh, strong disciplinary measures meted out to students nationwide in response to their protests. Um, so it was, at the time, I think the, the student administrator relationship was characterized by a great conflict. But um, in the aftermath of this, I think that there were many reforms achieved at many HBCUs um, than, than was often acknowledged or noted at the time. But you saw in curriculum, um, um, in, in particularly in curriculum, but in just in, in student student culture, I mean, student rights, the ending of in loco parentis, mm -hmm. ending compulsory ROTC. There were a range of demands mm -hmm. that students had, and they won and achieved many of them. You're watching Left of Black. We're joined this afternoon by Professor Martha Biondi, who is historian and Departments of African American Studies and History at Northwestern University, the author of the new book, The Black Revolution on Campus, and also the author of the award-winning To Stand and Fight, The Struggle of Civil Rights in post-World War II New York City. Uh, Martha, one of the kind of lasting legacies of these struggles, of course, is the creation of black studies. Uh, you mentioned particularly the role of the strike at San Francisco State in terms of redefining what a university can do in terms of its relationship to ethnic studies, for instance. Um, but black studies becomes this ongoing uh, product of this moment. And, and you mentioned that there's some real, in the early days, ideological struggles over what black studies should be, what it should look like. Um, you mentioned, for instance, that those uh, professors, for instance, who really just wanted to have very traditional, 
academic careers. I, I, I remember reading John Hope Franklin, for instance, was, was very adamant about his disinterest in black studies you know, for just that kind of reason, right? He saw himself as a historian uh, of black life and, and black studies somehow didn't, you know, coalesce with his vision of, of what he could be, you know, as a scholar. Can you talk about some of those early days of black studies and, and particularly um, the impact of, of an entity like the Institute for the Black World? Okay, great. There are a lot of good questions in there. Um, Yes, when black studies first emerged, the demand, it's important to remember it was waged primarily by students, right? So mm -hmm. scholars weren't calling for the creation of black mm -hmm. studies department. Students were. Um, many, you know, the small number of black scholars, professors at predominantly white universities at this time had been trained in traditional departments, you know, political science, English, history. And I, I would say that many had absorbed the traditionalist kind of skepticism mm -hmm. about whether black studies constituted um, a separate discipline, whether it really merited department status. And many endorsed uh, a different vision mm -hmm. uh, for changing the curriculum. They saw it better suited as a program, you know, which tends to be weaker than a department with less control over faculty hiring, right. uh, less control over the curriculum. It's kind of a joint effort with a mainstream traditional department. And at many, many universities, you know, faculty tend to be conservative types. Mm -hmm. And they wanted uh, the more kind of conservative or, 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 or gradual kind of introduction of this new curricular change uh, through something like a program. This was most famously the case at Harvard where that was the original plan, but students really insisted upon the creation of a department. Students saw departments as having more autonomy, having more status, having more control over, over hiring and firing, having large budgets. Now, we totally understand that today. Uh, I, we, you know, we are, have all been striving for departmental status for African American right, right. studies, and that was a big achievement. Students were very far-sighted, and I think their insistence, That's we're really benefiting yeah. today from their insistence upon departmental structure. But another reason I think individuals such as John Hope Franklin were skeptical of black studies was not only what I've just described, but the political valence of the time. Right. A department, and this is not true today, but a department was associated with black nationalism. Right. So if you advocated a department, you were a nationalist. That had a nationalist right. valence. Right. Whereas a program had a more integrationist uh, sort of balance to That's it. And so that yeah. was the way people responded uh, to this new student demand and to this whole idiom. Um, and students really held their ground. I mean, they really, they really saw the benefits of a department. They looked around on campus and said, well, how are other you know, forms of knowledge constituted and organized and departments were the prevailing form? And that's what they demanded. And ultimately that became the norm. And it's the creation of departments too have made possible the latest innovation in the field, which is moving toward PhD programs. Right had ended up with programs rather than departments, you know, that would have been a much harder bridge to cross the creation of, of, of a PhD in African American studies. And, and it raises some very interesting questions because when you think about the first generation of these black studies programs, you, you know, there aren't any folks walking around with PhDs in black studies in African American studies. I mean, what were some of the challenges trying to find individuals with mm -hmm. expertise um, you know, some of the early programs, students and alumni, you know, taught these classes. But, but what were some of the challenges of finding folks with expertise to be able to populate these departments and programs? Well, you're right. It was a challenge. I mean, partly because of what I've just mentioned, there, there, were, there was widespread skepticism among, among the small group of black scholars at many of these universities um, about this new enterprise. I mean, at Northwestern, at my own university, um, you know, Sterling Stuckey was a graduate student in the history department, joined the faculty in the history department, and he declined an offer to join the Department of African American Studies at the moment of its creation. I mean, it was seen, I think, by many young scholars, too, as a risky proposition. Right. It had just been born out of protest. They knew that many white intellectuals did not look at, really accord at legitimacy, yeah. saw it as a fruit of protest, saw it as a concession to protest, and it really was. I mean, it's, you know, I think at many places, administrators thought thought, well, maybe this will fade away or, or you know, they, they, they saw it as political. They saw it as giving something to the students. So it wasn't seen uh, as having academic legitimacy from the get-go. That's something that scholars had to struggle for and we still are struggling for uh, over the ensuing decades. So this all made hiring difficult. And, you know, one thing I really gained during the research process of this book was a great respect for this 
for this generation of student sort of architects of the field because they had to be really creative. They had to <laughs> assume a lot of adult responsibilities yeah. in shaping these departments. Many of them crisscrossed the country trying to recruit faculty. Um, and they were, even, of the, even though many of them were self-identified revolutionaries and had more political conceptions of, of, of the role of African American studies than is maybe predominant today, they still had a very strong sense of responsibility around doing it correctly and doing it right. They wanted these units to, to attract um, um, respect. They wanted them to have intellectual rigor. So they, they, they pursue people with PhDs. I mean, there's sort of a myth that they just wanted to sort of bring in activists. Um, but their first goal was to find, um, um, you know, when at San Francisco State, when they were setting up black studies, they, they urged the university to hire Nathan Hare as the first chair of the department. Mm -hmm. Nathan Hare had a PhD in sociology, and for the students, this was very appealing. They saw him as, as, a, as, a, you know, as a political ally and as somebody who was very sympathetic to their political mission. But the fact that he had a PhD you know, from the University of Chicago was really important to them because they wanted, they wanted to set up you know, lasting intellectual units. Um, yeah. And so they knew that this was going to be important. Um, so they really, they recruited in a creative way. They, um, you know, in some cases, student leaders who had been active in the struggle went on to graduate school and then went on to help um, set up and found some of these new departments. Um, two of the most famous examples of that are graduate students who came out of Northwestern, John Bracey and James Turner, mm -hmm. who were centrally involved in the student activism on campus and then went on to um, play really pioneering roles as part of the founding generation of African American studies. John Bracey went to UMass Amherst and James Turner went the to Cornell. the first director of Africana at Cornell. Yeah. Both of them are still at those institutions today, although recently retired. You know, one of the things that, that's interesting about this narrative that you talk about, um, this desire to see the university and black studies itself as, as serving a role beyond the training of students, right? That for it to have kind of a, a, a footprint in the lives of everyday folks. And I know that's been a kind of an ongoing struggle when you talk to kind of the folks who were there in the early days. And when one of the disappointments that they often express about contemporary black studies is that black studies really doesn't have that same kind of footprint and community as they might have envisioned it, you know, 40 or 50 years ago. Um, one particular interesting model that is the Institute of the Black World, um, mm -hmm. with folks like Vincent Harding and Abdullah Kalamat, who, who really, in some ways, before we came up with this language of black public intellectuals, are really seeing themselves as functioning in that role, you know, from their base in Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, yeah. absolutely. But before talking about the IBW, the Institute of the Black World, an extraordinary organization, I just want to say something about you know your opening point about you know is is has African American studies lost that connection yeah. to the community? Right. Um, it's an interesting question, and it's often difficult to quantify because <laughs> yeah, I because I mean when I look at some of my colleagues, you know, at Northwestern. Um, you know, many of them are involved in, in work in the community, right. some around restorative justice, some around alternative education, some around HIV AIDS. It may not be very visible yeah. to, that, yeah. to that generation. They may not be aware of it. But I actually think when I look around at my colleagues and colleagues at other universities, that many of us are actually very involved in various mm -hmm. kinds of civic engagement. Um, it may not be advertised or presented the way it was years ago, um, but I do actually think that there's some continuity there, and there's some, and I also see this with students. I mean, I'm always encountering un undergraduates who have that desire to, quote, give back to yeah. the community that so animated the black power generation, to be of service to the community. I mean, we send many of our graduates into the teaching profession and into law school mm -hmm. precisely with that desire to give back. So I, I feel like that that ethos, you know, that desire uh, still lives yeah. in, in black studies movement today. But now to go to your question about the Institute of the Black World. Uh, yeah, the Institute of the Black World was, you know, you know, this think tank that was founded by Vincent Harding and Abdullah Kalamad and Bill Strickland and a group of scholar activists in Atlanta. Um, they initially wanted to um, uh, 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 this to be connected formally to Atlanta University, and they right. imagined as the W. B. Du Bois Institute right. of African 
Boston Studies. Um, it ultimately became, a, first it was affiliated with the King Center, uh, and they, for, for kind of political reasons, broke with the King Center and became an independent uh, unit and entity with some Ford Foundation money early on in Atlanta. Um, and they really wanted to, they were committed to this idea of putting black intellectuals at the service of, of the broader black right. freedom at the service of, of the black community, um, of black students, and of, of, you know, making intellectuals a kind of vanguard uh, uh, in the black freedom struggle. Uh, and so they, they did some extraordinary work for several years. Um, I mean, they did have financial struggles, ultimately, that led to the closing, uh, 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 them to close doors in the early 1980s. But they um, were a very, very important think tank. That, that brought that uh, sponsored conferences, that issued various kinds of reports, um, that played, I think, an important role, uh, both, um, you know, both in higher education, but also in shaping, I think, black political advocacy and analysis in the early 1970s. Um, the IBW helped to produce the, the black agenda, the, um, the black platform that came out of the Gary Convention. So they, they also played an important um, role in, in political advocacy in addition to sort of shaping the early black studies movement. We've been joined this afternoon by Professor Martha Biondi, who's a historian at Northwestern University in the departments of African American and Studies and History. She's the author of the brand new book, The Black Revolution on Campus, as well as the author of the award-winning To Stand and Fight, The Struggle for Civil Rights in Post-War New York City, which was published in 2003. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, Martha. Oh, thank you. I was happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Eric, you're a real IG for this one. <laughs> yeah. All black everything. All black, you know. All black in the name of all my black heroes. All black everything. All black polos. All black medallions, yeah. All black, you know, say. All black.